the subject of today's session is one passage, one passage that stretches through a few chapters, but it is indeed one unit, the plagues of Egypt. The plagues of Egypt, striving to understand what they're about, what they tell us, what their purpose is. We read in the midst of the plagues, at the beginning of Exodus chapter 10, God said to Moses, Come in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these signs in the midst of them. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart is a subject in and of itself for a different discussion. But what's relevant for our purposes is, and that you may tell in the ears of your son and of your son's son, we could render the continuation of the verse, what I have wrought upon Egypt, but perhaps more literally, how I made a mockery of Egypt and my signs, which I have done among them, that you may know that I am God. So, there's an agenda here to have a story that you will retell to your children, to your grandchildren for time immemorial. Why? Why remember this story? Of course, you could say, to maintain an unbroken chain, to link up, which is true, but certainly inadequate. After all, as we have noted time and again, the Bible is not a history book. And even when it teaches us history, it's still not a history book, because its agenda is not simply teaching history. Torah, as we have noted many times, means teaching. It's teaching us how to live. It tells us about the past, only to provide us with guidance in the present and future. And for that, then, we need to focus upon the plagues, to focus upon them and what they teach us for our own lives, how they impact upon us. So, of course, to that end, we have 10 plagues. That's a lot of plagues. We need to make some order of it all. What is the progression of the plagues? We'll be discussing progressions a lot in this session. Actually, three different levels of progressions. But let's begin first by asking the most basic of questions. What is this sequence of plagues supposed to signify? We might think maybe it's a sequence of increasing severity. Problem is, it's patently clear that it's not. Let's just consider what takes place in the order of the plagues. Plague number one, blood. Blood. All the Nile, every body of water turning to blood means there is nothing to drink. That could be life-threatening. Plague number two, frogs. Frogs are undoubtedly an annoyance. They may also be a health hazard. After all, there may be problems of public hygiene, but hardly as critical a danger as that posed by not having anything to drink. Consider the third plague, lice. Lice is more of a nuisance than anything else. So if anything, when we consider the order of plagues one, two, and three, it's not an order of increasing severity. If anything, it's diminishing severity. Consider plague four in relation to plagues five and six. Plague four in Hebrew is arov, which is probably best rendered literally as swarms. Swarms of, well, the truth is, the Torah doesn't say. 
But the dominant view in our tradition is swarms of noxious creatures, wild beasts, wild beasts prowling the streets, the cities. That can certainly be deadly. Plague number five, a plague of pestilence that annihilated the livestock of Egypt. Now, with all due respect, that's loss of life, but loss of animal life. It's not the same as human life. Human life was not in any way threatened by plague number five. And again, with all due respect to animal life, we reckon animal life as most essentially property. So it impacted the property of the Egyptians, but not life and limb. Plague number six, boils. Well, again, perhaps the most apt way of describing plague number six is a nuisance. A more severe nuisance than lice, more painful. But still, if anything, when we consider the progression of plagues four, five, and six, diminishing severity, not increasing. Let's consider plagues seven, eight, and nine. Well, when we get to plague seven, hail, there is no need for extrapolation or interpretation at all. Moses explicitly warns Pharaoh, anyone, man or beast, who is outside when the hail strikes will die. These weren't little pieces of hail. These were boulders. So the plague number seven, threatened life, is explicit in Moses' words. Plague number eight, locust. True, Pharaoh describes the locust as this death. But locusts aren't literally death. That is, they may lead to mass starvation down the road, but it still is a far less dire impact than being smitten by boulders coming down from heaven. Plague number nine, darkness. Not, mind you, any old darkness, a darkness so palpable you could feel it, you couldn't move in it. But still, if plague number seven threatened life and plague number eight destroyed property, all of the produce, plague number nine claimed neither. And so again, when one considers the progression of plague seven, eight, and nine, it's diminishing, not increasing severity. So what then does the order of the plague signify? Of course, as you undoubtedly discern, I chose my examples and my groupings carefully, undoubtedly. The plagues as a whole represent increasing severity. Increasing severity, beginning with blood and culminating in the smiting of all the firstborn. It's just important for us to appreciate that that doesn't mean a linear progression of constantly increasing severity. I grouped the plagues into three sums, and I must concede that wasn't my idea. As we recount yearly at the Passover Seder, when we recount the 10 plagues of Egypt, besides listing the plagues serially, we also cite the tradition of the sage Rabbi Yehuda of grouping the plagues into threesomes, as I did. And those threesomes, ironically, are not internally threesomes of increasing severity. They are, if anything, diminishing severity. The increasing severity is from threesome to threesome. Now, when we consider what that means, and perhaps more penetratingly why that is so, 
we can't help but discern that in the plagues of Egypt, the division into three sums is actually not an invention of our sages. It's fairly explicit in the text. Just in order to see it explicit in the text, inevitably, one needs to read very carefully. So let's do that now. Because, of course, as you know, one of the most crucial premises in the way we read the Bible is, this is the Word of God. It's written the way it's written for a reason. And the deeper we read it, the more we can learn from it. So let's embark upon the ten plagues of Egypt. Beginning in Exodus chapter 7, when God sends Moses to warn Pharaoh of the first of the plagues. In verse 15, go unto Pharaoh in the morning. Now I'm going to be very precise in translating here for a reason, as will become shortly very clear. Lo, he goes out unto the water, and you shall stand by the river's brink to meet him. And the staff, which was turned to a serpent, shall you take in your hand. Verse 16, and you shall say unto him, God, the Lord of the Hebrews, has sent me unto you, saying, pay careful attention to the central recurrent message here. The translation reads, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. I might quibble here and propose, send my people forth that they may serve me in the wilderness. But what is most critical here is, let my people go. Maybe a nice song from a generation or two ago, but that's not what God says. That's not what God says here. That's not what God says anywhere. It is never, let my people go, period. It is not a summons for national liberation. It's let my people go, that they may serve me. Right now they're serving you, Pharaoh. Let them go, that they may serve me. It's not about, about liberation. It's about whom are you serving? And so then, that is the summons. And if you refuse to listen, verse 17, in this, you shall know that I am God. Behold, I will smite with the staff that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. Now, this is plague number one. And I reiterate the manner in which it is introduced. Go unto Pharaoh in the morning. He goes out unto the water. And you shall stand by the river's brink to meet him. You stand there waiting for him to come. And then you warn him about the plague. This we should compare with the manner in which Moses is bidden to warn Pharaoh about plague number two. In verse 26, God spoke unto Moses, Come in unto Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says God, Let my people go that they may serve me. Again, it's not let my people go. And if you refuse, to listen this time, verse 27, I will smite all your border with frogs. So note the distinction with respect to plague number one. You shall stand by the river's brink to meet him. With respect to plague number two, come in unto Pharaoh. And what about the warning for plague number three? Please don't take my word for it. Search, search long and hard. Find me a forewarning for plague number three. It's not there. That completes the first threesome. When we get to the fourth plague in Exodus chapter 8, in verse 16, note, rise up early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he goes forth to the water. Almost exactly the same words that we saw, not with respect to 
any of the intervening plagues, but specifically, just as we saw in plague number one, go out to Pharaoh in the morning, he goes out onto the water, you shall stand by the river's brink to meet him. And, of course, the continuation, thus says God, let my people go that they may serve me, and if you don't, I will send swarms of noxious creatures, of wild beasts against you. Plague number four. Plague number five, come in unto Pharaoh. Note, exactly the same formulation that we saw in chapter seven, verse 26, with respect to plague number two. As for plague number six, I suspect it will come as no surprise to you that like plague number three, there is no forewarning. And the pattern repeats yet again a third time. We get to the plague of the hell, and in chapter 9, verse 13, it is rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Stand before Pharaoh, the same formulation that we saw in plagues one and four. Thus says God, the Lord of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. The recurrent theme. And if you don't, comes a very grievous hail. Plague number eight, once again, come in unto Pharaoh. For I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs in the midst of them. And, of course, the consequence of not listening here, not heeding the message of, let my people go that they may serve me, is tomorrow will I bring locusts into your border. Plague number nine, I suspect it comes as no surprise, is without any forewarning in the Torah. And so we have this recurrent cycle. Plague number one, stand before Pharaoh. He comes to you. He's going out to the water. Plague number two, come in unto Pharaoh. Plague number three, no forewarning at all. And perhaps the best way of understanding this, apropos of our observation of the mechanics of each threesome, at the beginning of the threesome, God says, you don't go into Pharaoh's domain. You don't invade his turf. You stand there, wait for him to come to you, and you warn him. You warn him about an impending plague. Let's see what he does. If he says, okay, I give in, fine. If not, not only will a plague result, but after that plague results, the second plague of that threesome, you're not going to stand and wait for him anymore. Now you will invade his domain. Come in to Pharaoh and warn him. As consequence to your intransigence in the previous plague, now Moses is bidden to invade Pharaoh's domain and warn him about the next plague. But inevitably, under such circumstances, the next plague is not going to be as severe as the opener of the threesome. And with respect to the third plague in each threesome, it's the least severe. It's, so to speak, a bonus. A bonus because of your intransigence in the previous two plagues. But indeed, in each threesome, the first plague of the threesome is most severe. The second less so, and the third more nuisance than anything else. The message collectively of the threesome is you will pay the price of your refusal to listen. And what we see taking place here is the metamorphosis of Pharaoh from a human being into a no machine, into someone who doesn't have the capacity to respond in any other way, even if he realizes he's bringing ruin upon himself, his people, and his land. No, 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 
relentlessly all the way to the end. Now, when we consider the relationship between these three sums, we definitely see increasing severity. We already noted the first plague in the first three sum, blood, meant that the Egyptians had nothing to drink. The first plague of the second three sum, taken as swarms of wild beasts, could be directly life threatening. The first of the third three sum, plague number seven, hail, is explicitly described as life threatening. And so we see when we compare the elements of each threesome, just as the first elements of each threesome are increasingly more severe, so the second. From frogs to a plague of pestilence that annihilates the livestock of Egypt to the plague of locusts that leave Egypt without anything left in the fields in danger of mass starvation. And likewise, the third plague of each threesome from lice to boils to darkness, again, increasing severity. Within each threesome, diminishing severity. From threesome to threesome, there's a message. You take responsibility for your actions and for your decisions, and you will pay their price. It's, of course, precisely in this vein that we can well appreciate the manner in which the 10th plague is introduced. The 10th plague doesn't follow any of the patterns that we saw heretofore. Well, first of all, because Moses is standing in Pharaoh's presence. When God says to Moses that he is to introduce the 10th plague. And so we read in chapter 11 and verse 4, Moses said, Thus says God, about midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sits upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. Until now, I have sent my agents. I have sent the plagues. Now I'm coming myself. Now, of course, God doesn't occupy some particular space. But there is a dimension of divine imminence. God's presence will be in Egypt, smiting the firstborn with an intensity that Egypt had not previously known. In some sense, we can understand plague number 10 as the beginning of the next threesome, increasing severity. Blood, swarms of wild beasts, hail, the smiting of the firstborn. There is no fourth threesome because the smiting of the firstborn is the final plague. After that, Pharaoh relents. Something has taken place here. There has been a growth and development process. We could note here, when one considers the three sums as a sequence, plagues one, two, and three are all down there, pertaining to the Nile, the water turning to blood, the Nile gushing forth frogs, or the dust, the dust that turns to lice. Plagues four, five, and six are here. The swarms of wild beasts, the pestilence that annihilates the livestock, the boils on man and beast. Plagues seven, eight, and nine are up there. Hell falling down from heaven. Locust coming in from the heavens. The plague of darkness over all the heavens in Egypt. There is some sense of progressively getting greater and greater. The circle moves ever outward. The effects of the plague are that much more powerful. There is an ongoing sense of how the plagues of Egypt are going to affect Egypt. But when we consider the progression, this is the progression. This is the manner in which we see the plagues in their 
mounting intensity. And in their lessons. Because ultimately, when we consider what we are to make of these plagues, again, as we noted, we're not interested in knowing the history simply in order to know what happened once. We're interested in considering what the plagues of Egypt teach us today. In attempting to discern what the lessons of the plagues are, once again, of course, it's important for us to pay attention to the details. And as we pay attention to these details, we discern that in the story of the plagues, on eight occasions, there is a message that you will know. Let's consider the progression of these lessons. The first lesson is expressed, as we might well expect, at the outset. That is, when the plagues are about to begin to unfold. We read after God introduces Moses to the plan that is to unfold. In chapter 7, in verse 5, a kind of general statement that will pertain to everything that is going to happen henceforth. The background, as God says in the previous verse, Pharaoh will not hearken unto you, and I will lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my hosts, my people, the people of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And Egypt will know that I am God when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt. What does that mean? Will know that I am God. We have, admittedly, discussed this elsewhere. In particular, the message that is conveyed in Exodus chapter 6 of God's holy name that is to be communicated to Israel that ultimately is to be communicated to the world. The name that signifies not merely manipulating nature, small-scale miracles. The name that signifies obliterating nature, completely negating nature something completely different. The name that more than any other is God's proper name. The name that more than any other signifies God as creator, author of nature, and therefore sovereign over nature. And so the plagues have that purpose. You need to learn. The whole world needs to learn that I am God, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. With that, as the general background, we consider the incremental lessons as this message is brought home. Because inevitably, we realize that the plagues of Egypt are a course of study. And there are a number of discrete thresholds that need to be crossed in order for this lesson to be fully integrated. The second time there is a lesson to be learned is when Moses is speaking to Pharaoh, speaking to Pharaoh and introducing plague number one. In this, you shall know that I am God. How apropos that it is at the first plague, first. Number one, there is a number one. And indeed, in knowing about that number one, you need to know that God is God. Again, Tetragrammaton, God's holy name. You need to know there is a sovereign and only one sovereign over everything. The next time we have a lesson to learn, it pertains to plague number two in a very specific context that is. After the frogs strike, we read in chapter 8, verse 4, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat God that he take away the frogs from me and from my people. And 
Moses responds in verse 5, Have you this glory over me? For what time shall I entreat for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be destroyed from you and from your houses and remain in the river only? When do you want them to leave? Now, of course, under the circumstances, Pharaoh already said the frogs are driving me crazy. Get rid of them. What would you expect Pharaoh to say? Get rid of them right now. He doesn't. In verse 6, and he said, for tomorrow. And here's the lesson. Moses said, be it according to your word, that you may know that there is none like unto God our Lord. What's going on? Why did Pharaoh say, for tomorrow? Well, he doesn't say. And the Bible doesn't tell us either. But perhaps we can conjecture a couple of possibilities. One possibility, maybe Pharaoh anticipates that Moses is very clever in his understanding of the way nature operates, the way frogs operate, maybe skilled in prognostication. Moses knows that the frogs are going to disappear today. So he comes to me and asks me to choose when I want the frogs to go away, and I'll try to trick him by saying, I don't want them to go away tomorrow. He anticipates I'm going to say, get rid of them today, and he already knows they're leaving today regardless. I'll say for tomorrow in order to trip him up. That's one possibility. Pharaoh needs to save face. That is, if I can trip up Moses, I can show I'm in charge. And the second possibility, maybe even more so, I'm in charge. You're not going to browbeat me with frogs. I can handle them another day. So let them stay until tomorrow. For tomorrow, but not for today. I'm in charge. I can take care of myself. You're not in charge. If your consideration is, eh, maybe Moses is just a good soothsayer or fortune teller, no. As Moses tells Pharaoh, that you may know that there is none like unto God our Lord. He's in control. He's in charge. And if the reason you said only tomorrow is because you wanted to show how you're still in control of everything, you are not in control. God is in control. You will learn to bow before God because you're not in control. In other words, the lesson here is learned precisely because Pharaoh is still trying to hold on to whatever shred of authority he thinks he has. You will learn that there is none like God our Lord. And, you know, maybe in some sense we could add here the symbolism of numbers, the significance of the number two. There is no number that signifies plurality, multiplicity, more than the number two. In Hebrew, this is graphically expressed in the word for two itself. For the Hebrew experts, you undoubtedly know. Two is in the masculine form shnayim, in the feminine form shtayim. What's significant here is this is the only number in which the plural yim is embedded in the name of the number itself. All subsequent numbers don't have that. It's at that threshold of moving from one to two, moving into a realm of multiplicity. There are multiple possibilities. You might think well, you know, there's God, there's Pharaoh, and there may be all sorts of other sources of power at work in the world as well. No. We get to two, and it's precisely at this juncture that you will know that there is none like unto God our Lord. None of that multiplicity is going to amount to any competition whatsoever. Again, the lesson that emerges from Plague number two, none like unto God our Lord. The next lesson we learn, 
when Moses is warning Pharaoh about plague number four. In verse 18, and I will set apart in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of noxious creatures or wild beasts will be there, to the end that you may know that I am God in the midst of the earth. Now, note here a couple of interesting observations. First of which is that this is the first plague in which God says explicitly that the plague is going to strike Egypt and it's not going to strike the land of Goshen in which my people dwell. Well, of course, perhaps the most obvious explanation for the emphasis here is this is the first time we're dealing with big mediators of the plague. Blood, frogs, lice, tiny little things. Uh, true, the blood spread through every body of water, but nonetheless, it's down there. Wild animals on the prowl can go anywhere. They're not going to the land of Goshen. And what is that to teach Pharaoh? This is a new lesson that you may know that I am God in the midst of the earth. Meaning what? Meaning as opposed to those who may think God is out there, but uninvolved, unaware of what takes place in here. It's crucial that you know I am God in the midst of the earth. Consider, in a way, the similar lesson that emerged at the beginning of Genesis, when, as we noted, with each threshold in the process of creation, it's not just that God creates. It's that afterward, God saw that it was good. God saw God is interacting with the world after the creation has taken place, that it was good. God has expectations of the world, that the world needs to deliver. That is, the ongoing providential involvement of God in the world. It's not that God just hurls the plague at Egypt and then, so to speak, walks away. God does indeed plague Egypt. But even as Egypt is being plagued, God is there and protecting those who will not be the victims of his plague. So here there is indeed an additional threshold. And it is perhaps especially apropos that this lesson that I am God in the midst of the earth takes place in the context of plague number four. Again, when we consider the symbolisms of numbers, the significance of the number four in our tradition, four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. In the expansiveness of the world, plague number four, you need to learn, I am God in the midst of the earth. I am involved. Next threshold, next lesson is when God is introducing the plague of the hail in Exodus chapter 9 and in the warning of the impending plague. We read in verses 14 through 16, for I will this time send all my plagues upon your person and upon your servants and upon your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Surely now, I had put forth my hand and smitten you and your people with pestilence, and you had been obliterated. You had been annihilated from the earth. I could have done that. Just as when in plague number five, I annihilated the livestock, I could have annihilated you. So why are you still here? But in very deed for this cause have I made you to stand to show you my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. So note a certain element of commonality that is 
in verse 14, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. In verse 16, that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. That theme of kol ha'aretz, all the earth, is of course prevalent in them both. What's the significance here? What's the message? Of course, the message most directly, most literally, is not merely knowing that I am in the midst of the earth, that I am present, but I'm the only one present. There is nothing to compete. There is none like me in all the earth. And therefore, my name may be declared throughout all the earth. And we can't help but note that this is taking place, of course, between plagues six and seven. And as we considered the significance of the number four, the expansiveness of four cardinal directions, we consider the significance of these numbers. Of course, there are four cardinal directions in the plane, but when we consider the totality of space, there are six directions, the four of the plane, north, south, east, west, and of course also up and down, six. But this is, again, on the cusp of plagues six and seven. Where does seven come in? You know, when you have six cardinal directions, you've covered all directions, but do you have the wherewithal to localize anything in a meaningful manner in space? No. You don't. Because what you lack is a central point, a point of origin from which to reckon these directions. That central point. That central point that takes the six, the six directions, and makes them meaningful. That's the seventh. It works in space. Of course, it also works in time. There are six days upon which we are summoned to work to do all of our creative labor. And there is the seventh, the Sabbath. The Sabbath, what gives meaning, what uplifts the other six. And so in appreciating this lesson, it is precisely between number six and number seven that we learn there is none like me in all the earth, that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Because ultimately it is that that makes life meaningful, that makes the earth meaningful. It's the seventh that injects meaning and significance into all the other six. Next threshold in this progression is after plague number seven, inevitably on the road to plague number eight, after Pharaoh calls in Moses to get rid of the hell, in verse 29, Moses said unto him, as soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread forth my hands unto God. The thunders will cease. Neither shall there be any more hell that you may know that the earth is God's. Now, you may be wondering, What's the difference here? That is, what is so fundamentally different between saying that there is none like me in all the earth, or for that matter, the previous lesson, which is, as we noted, that I, God, am in the midst of the earth, and the lesson that is emerging here in verse 29, that the earth is God's. It's important for us to appreciate there's a crucial difference. The crucial difference is, as long as we talk about, I am God in the midst of the earth, there is none like me in the earth, God comes across as also in the earth. But God is not in the earth. God is manifest on earth, but God transcends the earth. God is not limited by the earth. That you may know that the earth is God's means to cite the expression in our tradition, God 
is the place of the earth. The earth is not his place. God transcends the universe, is not subsumed within the universe. And this is, again, the lesson that is to be learned after Plague 7, and ultimately, as we move in the direction of Plague number 8. The eighth level in our tradition always signifies transcendence. Again, as we noted, meaning in earth, both in space and in time, is the seventh. The eighth is going beyond, beyond the world, beyond the world into that realm in which you may know that the earth is God's. Now, still and all, in the lead up to the next plague, to plague number eight, the plague of locusts. There is that passage that we noted at the beginning of today's session, that the reason for these plagues is that you may tell in the ears of your son and of your son's son how I made a mockery of Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am God, that who may know that I am God, that everyone, Jew and Egyptian, that the whole world may know. And of course, we can't help but note that this lesson is almost a precise restatement of the lesson that we saw at the beginning of the entire progression. Remember, when the plagues were poised to begin, the lesson that was the basis of the entire enterprise was that Egypt shall know that I am God when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt. And here indeed, the fulfillment. The fulfillment is indeed that realization that you may know that I am God, that I am God, the holy name, the tetragrammaton, that I am God, sovereign over nature, not merely manipulating nature, negating nature. So, of course, at this point, we readily discern we've come full circle. And to that extent, have we then exhausted the lessons of the plagues? Well, of course, you know the answer is no. Because after all, this is still in the lead up to plague number eight. That means plagues eight, nine, and ten still lie ahead. What's the lesson that ultimately kept? All of these, the final lesson of the ten plagues. Well, I have to admit, at first brush, it seems downright anticlimactic when we read of the impending plague. And this, of course, is the plague of the firstborn that is introduced, as we saw in Exodus chapter 11, in verses 4 and 5 and on. In verse 7, but against any of the people of Israel shall not a dog wet his tongue or growl, whine, against man or beast that you may know how that God does put a difference between Egypt and Israel. That God puts a difference between Egypt and Israel. That's the final lesson? But after all, wasn't the whole purpose of the plagues in order to learn this far more exalted lesson that you may know that I am God? Well, yes and no. Of course, that is the purpose. That is the goal, that you may know that I am God. But why is that the goal? Why is it so important to know about God? To give God, if you'll pardon the expression, some kind of... Um, Ego trip. God doesn't need us to know him. We need us to know him. Indeed, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 10, in verses 12 and 13. And now Israel, asks Moses rhetorically, what does God your Lord ask of you? What does he ask of you? Nothing much, right? 
but to fear God your Lord, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve God your Lord with all of your heart, with all your soul, to keep the commandments of God and his statutes which I command you this day. That's what does God ask of you? It seems like God is asking an awful lot. Except I conveniently admitted the words that are labeled here in verse 13. And truth is that in the Hebrew original, these words are the last two words of verse 13. I think much better placed there than anywhere else in the Hebrew, letov lach, for your good. So in summation, when we consider the sequence that takes place here, asks Moses, now Israel, what does God ask of you? Is he asking anything of you for his own good? True, he's asking a lot to fear him, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, to keep the commandments and the statutes. But it's all for your good. It's not for him. God doesn't have any wants, any lacking. God doesn't have any deficiency that needs to be filled in by us. This is all for our benefit. And so, when we read relentlessly this message of knowing that God is God, it's not because God needs to hear that. It's because we need to know it. We've noted on many occasions, God signifies absolute truth, absolute goodness, absolute righteousness, absolute justice. The glorification of God is the glorification of all these. It is imperative for us to know God, to know this more than anything else. But how does this bear on that final lesson? That you may know how God puts a difference between Egypt and Israel? Now again, of course, you will recall, we already noted, when Moses is charged by God to warn Pharaoh of plague number four, God already says, I will make this separation, this difference between the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen, where my people reside. True, but again, I'll reiterate, where God drew the distinction there, it was still as means to knowing I am God in the midst of the earth. It wasn't about Israel. Israel was merely a means to teaching that lesson about God. Here, tantalizingly, the lesson itself is about Israel. To know that God puts a difference between Egypt and Israel. Why is that so important? Consider this. The whole sequence of the plagues is there to bring Pharaoh, to bring Egypt, to bring the world, to bring us to this crucially important threshold, knowing about God. But the plagues don't last forever. The plagues are here one day, gone the next. What, for all time, will serve as the beacon to teach the world about God, to enable the world to get to its greatest good, which can only be attained when you know about God? The answer, God's charge to Israel. You are my witnesses. You teach the world. And so, after all the theological lessons have ostensibly been taught, there is that crucial additional lesson that you may know how God puts a difference between Egypt and Israel. And Israel, on an ongoing basis, will be the conveyors of that lesson, the teachers of that lesson, by their actions, by their Torah, by their very survival. That indeed, Israel operates by divine license. Israel is there to introduce 
God to the world. And having considered this, we consider one final dimension. I said there were three progressions that we needed to consider. And the third, to consider at least briefly, is a crucial additional dimension here. Namely, so with all these lessons, what does Pharaoh actually learn? And that, of course, inevitably brings us to an additional progression. The lessons learned by Pharaoh. Well, what does Pharaoh have to say? First, in Exodus chapter 5, in verse 2, after Moses introduces himself to Pharaoh and introduces his mission, Pharaoh says, Who is God that I should hearken unto his voice to let Israel go? I know not God, moreover, I will not let Israel go. I don't know anything about God, and I'm not interested. And of course, Pharaoh's protestation takes on particular significance when one considers what God says to Moses, and that is that Egypt will know that I am God. The crucial goal. The first step in Pharaoh's rehabilitation comes at the end of the plague of the frogs when Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, entreat God that he take away the frogs from me and from my people. Entreat God. I can't do this on my own. Which admittedly, for someone who presented himself as a God himself in his own right, is a very powerful statement of humility. But it's not enough. The next threshold of lessons learned by Pharaoh is when in chapter 8, verse 24, Pharaoh doesn't merely say, entreat God. He says, entreat for me. And what is the particular significance of entreat for me, as opposed to merely a generic entreat God? For someone, again, who has presented himself as a God, I have deficiencies. I have lacks. I need you to entreat God for me. And so the second lesson that Pharaoh needs to learn in Pharaoh's own rehabilitation is I need to bow down before the one who is greater than I am. That, again, is the next threshold, but we're not finished yet. After the plague of hell, Pharaoh's admission to Moses, I have sinned this time. God is righteous and I and my people are wicked. Entreat God and let there be enough of these mighty thunderings in hell. Of course, what's crucial here, and what indeed signifies the important growth and development in Pharaoh is, I have sinned. I'm the problem. I realize I need to confess my sin before I can even ask you to entreat God. Which is good, but obviously still insufficient. The next threshold comes after the plague of locusts where in subtle but crucial distinction to the previous admission, I have sinned against God your Lord and against you. Now therefore, forgive, I pray you, my sin only this once and entreat God your Lord that he may take away from me this death only. The crucial difference? In the previous admission, yes, Pharaoh did say, I have sinned this time. God is righteous, but he went on to say, I and my people are wicked. And you know, the moment you say, I and my people, inevitably, you mitigate your responsibility. It's not really me, it's them. I'm just part of this larger group. And I have a certain degree of anonymity by virtue of being part of the group. Yeah, but after the plague of locusts, it is, I have sinned against God your Lord. 
nothing about the people. And moreover, and this likewise is critical, I have sinned against God your Lord and against you. So long as I see my sin as simply against God, okay, well, God is out there and he'll take care of himself. But when I admit that I sinned against you, I sinned against the human being, I need to entreat you, you, please forgive me. I sinned against you. And so Pharaoh has learned. He has sinned. He has sinned against people. He needs forgiveness from his victims. It would seem that having come to this dramatic admission of guilt, that Pharaoh has already finished. But of course, once again, we know that's obviously not the case. Because after this admission, as after all the previous admissions, Pharaoh still goes back on his word. And inevitably, after the plague of the locust, after plague number eight, plagues nine and ten are still in the wings. The crucial transformation takes place specifically in the aftermath of plague number 10. In Exodus chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, rise up, get you forth from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve God as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And bless me also. You may say, is that so very different from entreat God your Lord? Answer, yes. It's crucially different. I can say entreat God your Lord on the premise that Israel is just a pain in the neck a nuisance. They brought upon me calamity after calamity. Entreat God your Lord to get this away from me. But what Pharaoh says in the wake of Plague 10, in the wake of the greatest calamity that happened, and bless me also, I've come to the realization you're not the problem. I'm the problem. You're a blessing. Pharaoh says to Moses and Aaron, and by extension collectively to Israel, bless me also. You are the source of blessing. Blessing for me. A blessing for Egypt. A blessing for the world. All this time, I was defending myself. Now, having really nothing to defend, my firstborn was just taken from me. My country is in ruins. Everything in devastation. I realize I brought it all upon myself to my failure to realize all along you were the blessing and I was the problem, not the other way around. And so it is with that realization the realization that I need you to bless me, that the sequence of the plagues culminates in its final note. Just as what God said was to be the crucial final lesson that Pharaoh needed to learn, I will make a division between Egypt and Israel. That division was who is going to serve as the conduit of blessing from God into the world? Bless me also. I got the message. It's not about God getting something from us. It certainly is the matter of Israel getting something from Egypt, not on this level. It's about recognizing what altogether is happening in the world. It's about recognizing, indeed, that in the vast continuum of existence, the plagues of Egypt are really such a narrow parenthesis. 
Over the course of how much? A few months, all the plagues of Egypt are over. But there will be an ongoing mechanism for reminding the world about God. That ongoing mechanism for reminding the world about God, specifically, is Israel. Bless me also. And indeed, it is on that note that we consider the final historical reckoning of the plagues in Micha, in chapter 7, when the prophet says, As in the days of your going forth out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. Note the statement here. In the days of your going out of the land of Egypt, I will show him, not just Israel, I will show him marvelous things. Israel went out of Egypt, but the whole world sees marvelous things because of that message that God is indeed sovereign, that you will know that I am God. The whole world sees marvelous things by consequence. And in the words of Jeremiah, as a result, the lesson of the Exodus actually becomes eclipsed when there are greater lessons that lie ahead. But they're all ultimately lessons that harness what takes place to Israel to teach the world. In Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, Therefore behold, the days come, says God, that it shall no more be said, as God lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But as God lives that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. And I will bring them back into their land that I gave unto their fathers. And through that, the world will learn this lesson. God never left. God continues to guide the world. God continues to teach the world. Even a world that for so much of its history has proven itself such an unwilling student. But through the fate of Israel, this lesson will be learned. Now, obviously, that doesn't bestow upon Israel any promise of an easy time of it. Rather, on the contrary, I reiterate, the recurrent message over and over again, let my people go that they may serve me. It's not about their liberation. It's about a far more exalted, albeit far more arduous and demanding bondage to know that as the instruments of spreading this message out throughout the world, they will be the means for all the world to know about God. They will be witnesses to God. This, above all else, is the blessing that Israel needs to bestow upon and for the benefit of the whole world. And so it is that when we consider this mounting progression, again, the culmination of the lessons of the Exodus, you will know that I make a division between Egypt and Israel. And the culmination of the lessons that indeed are to be gleaned from the plagues of Egypt by Pharaoh himself, bless me also. Israel is the means to blessing. Not for its sake. For the world. Because the world needs to hear this message. The world needs to know all of these lessons. The world needs to take responsibility and return to its source in God. And so, finally, most conclusively, when you've learned this, you've learned what you need to learn. Until that point, the message of the plagues of Egypt is not merely consigned to history. It is with us. It is a presence in perpetuity. May we indeed learn this lesson. May we indeed appreciate. Bless me also 
through the role that is being shouldered by Israel, being placed upon Israel, Israel will be a means for blessing the world. May we see that blessing with our very eyes. God bless you.